Okay, so we had uh, some examples this morning, haven't we? Uh, so we've seen um, a negative influence, if like, of bullying, uh, of coercion, of lies, of deceit, of misinformation, uh, seeking to exert authority and power over another person. So if we took a, here um, a, a dictionary definition of influence, that's what's happening, isn't it? The power or capacity to make an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. So that's what Putin is trying to do. Uh, but we've had another example of Mission Possible, and we've seen the influence there of a group of people who are seeking to affect the behavior and the hopes and the, the future life of another group of people. And then we've just heard uh, from Poland uh, of what is happening there. So there are negative influences in our lives, and there are positive influences in our lives. We ought to celebrate the positive, but be very aware, very wise, as we uh, recognize the negative things happening in our lives. So let's move on, because uh, I want to really push this forward if we can. So what are the influences at work uh, in our everyday lives? <clears throat> and we really, really need to be conscious of these things. Uh, so there are powerful influences shaping the way we think, shaping our behavior, shaping our thoughts, shaping our view of life, shaping our hopes for the future. Uh, and they come from many sources, and here are a few of them. They come from our personal relationships, the people who most affect the way we think and behave. Uh, they come from our families. And uh, we know that families can be incredibly supportive, but they can be incredibly unhelpful and discouraging uh, when they stand, for example, against our faith position. Uh, we know that there's enormous uh, influence on us from advertising. Uh, from the media, from social media, uh, from television, radio, all this, and from politicians, uh, from all sorts of sources, voices speaking into our lives, all wanting to draw us into a particular direction, all wanting to persuade us that we should, uh, um, we should hear what they've got to say, heed what they've got, go their particular way, buy their particular brand, live their particular lifestyle, open up to whatever it is that they want us to be open to. Powerful forces at work in our lives. And we need uh, to recognize that there's a battle going on. I don't know whether you recognize that, but there is. There's a battle to win your loyalty, to win your cooperation, to win your uh, buying power. There's a battle going on to uh, control your thoughts. There's a battle going on wanting to uh, uh, shut you down from certain thoughts. And we can see that happening very, very clearly in totalitarian states. Uh, the way that all sorts of media is shut down, people are controlled, uh, they are being um, manipulated to, to, and coerced to, to come into line with the, the, uh, the authorities. There's a battle going on. And there's a spiritual battle going on too. There's a battle going on uh, to persuade you to be loyal to and to follow another way of life other than the way of life that you were created for. The way that God created us to know him, to love him, to follow him. And there's a battle going on to, to, to persuade us that there is no such God, or that God is vile, or that God is, uh, is a God causing suffering in the world, or that God is dead, that God is irrelevant. There's a battle going on in uh, our lives, in our minds. Oh, it suddenly stopped on me. <laughs> Try again. Oh, that's unhelpful. Here we go. <laughs> Nope. Right. I'm going to have to look over to Phil and uh, do the boring thing. There we go, Phil. Well, okay, so we're going to um, this incredibly important verse, I think, from Romans chapter 12, where Paul says these things. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God is wanting to open our eyes. He's wanting to expand our vision. He's wanting to, to uh, uh, replace lies and deception with truth. There's a, uh, 
a transforming process that he wants to take us through so that we might know him, so we might hear his voice. We might be confident that we're hearing his voice, that we might be able to, that we might begin to walk more and more fully in his way, become more and more conformed to his life, to be more like him, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So what fills our minds, what our minds are occupied with, uh, is really, really important. So if we go on, Phil, please. <clears throat> So we're thinking here then about, uh, oh, have we shot on to? Don't worry. Um, we're thinking here about uh, Ezra 9, and we're thinking about the power of influence, and we're thinking about what insights might, make, might we gain from that this morning. And I shall try to, to be brief. Um, let's just pray again, shall we? Father, this is such an important topic. Lord, you know how, how powerfully Satan and the world around us uh, want to control our thinking, want to restrict our thinking, want to dumb you down, Lord, want to make you small or irrelevant. And we're praying today, Lord, that uh, we would be reminded of uh, those forces at work in our lives every single day, every hour, every minute of our lives. Help us, Lord, grow in our capacity to be able to withstand those voices because we're listening to your voice, because we're walking closely with you, because we're hearing clearly from you. Lord, be the most important influence in our lives. Be the one who most shapes us and molds us. Be the one who most reassures us and gives us strength and courage to face what is happening in our lives. So Lord, guide us now as we explore further in Ezra 9. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's use a little bit of imagination, shall we? Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, I want you to imagine the uh, experience of the people of God, the people of Israel. Um, they, they have their city destroyed uh, by the Babylonians. They're taken into captivity. Just try and get into that. What does that feel like, to be uprooted? And that's exactly what's happening for some people right now, fleeing from danger, um, being uh, moved from all that's uh, uh, familiar and comfortable and, and uh, deep-rooted in their lives. This is the experience of the Israelite people, taken into captivity. Imagine yourself going from a backwater place, uh, such as Judea, into the heart of the empire, uh, seeing the might and the power and the authority and the wealth and the success of this people. And uh, imagine what effect that would have on you, going to the big city uh, and seeing how contrasting that is to your life. Imagine 60 years of being immersed in Babylonian culture. 60 years. Imagine how um, little by little uh, that would seep into the souls and hearts and minds of, uh, of, of those people. Imagine how uh, uh, you'd want to uh, get into, uh, uh, into, into work, into prosperity, into ownership, uh, into uh, uh, agreement with the culture around you. So some would integrate. But some kept their own identity as, as a Jewish people. And then we find that difficult because all around us, we're living in a culture that is seeking to uh, shape and mold us and is seeking to uh, uh, draw us away from a clear Christian identity as a follower of Jesus. And it's, uh, <coughs> it's drawing us and <coughs> persuading us by a thousand voices to, to fall into line with the world around us. So after the 60 years, <coughs> some at least, uh, had kept their identity, and they returned back to Jerusalem. And, and imagine again what that's like. Everything's changed. There are far bigger uh, and, uh, and at times hostile communities that you're trying to settle into. Uh, and as we've been reminded, uh, for 15 years, there was a, uh, a lack of progress. Having started well, um, uh, the temple stopped being built because of the strength, the hostility, the coercion, the influence of the people around them. 
and uh, I think it was Tom who was reminding us about how easy it was to imagine, uh, you know, wanting to say uh, 15 years, you know, uh, we, 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 let's just fall in line a little bit. Let's just, um, you know, uh, relate to the people around us. Let's start to build our lives. Let's start to try and have a, have a comfortable life, a, a peaceful life. So we, we want a bit peace with the people around us. There's a little phrase that uh, comes up so often uh, in discussions about people with very strong different views. And it's a powerful one. It works both ways, negatively and positively. Uh, little phrases, they're really nice, you know. Really nice. So when you meet all these people uh, who are wanting to kind of draw us away from Jesus into their lifestyles, into their ways of thinking, so often, well, it's so attractive. It's so comfortable. It's so easy. Who wants to be battling all the time? Who wants to be warring with these? They're really nice people. And there's so much truth in that, isn't there? I imagine then that the Israelites were feeling exactly the same, being drawn into uh, the culture and the lifestyle of the, of the people of Canaan, the people around Jerusalem. And imagine, too, the way that over all of that period, how we become desensitized to the, the worst of that other culture how we begin to accommodate to it, and how we begin to accept it as, well, that's, that's life, isn't it? And we experience the same. We become desensitized to the things that God says are wrong, the things that are harmful, the things that will lead to destruction in people's lives. So we dumb down sin. We, we start to say what God says is wrong is, well, it's not that bad, really because we want to fall or, or, or be on good terms with the world in which we live. We become increasingly desensitized, so gradually absorbing into ourselves the values and the practices of the people around us. So it's okay then to marry other people from other races and other cultures and other religions. It's okay to develop business uh, partnerships. It's okay to, to you know, have those deep uh, and they are uh, impacting relationships with the people around us. D.A. Carson says this, if we could just move on to the next, uh, uh, that's brilliant. Yeah, okay, this is quite a powerful quote, I think, really, and I wonder how it affects you. People do not drift towards holiness apart from grace-driven effort. People do not gravitate towards godliness or prayer, obedience or scripture, faith or, or delight in the Lord. We drift towards compromise, and we call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience, and we call it freedom. We drift towards superstition, we call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of lost self-control, and we call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking we're escaping from legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves we've been liberated ponder that one let's move on so we read in Ezra uh, 7 and 8 about uh, uh, Ezra returning uh, with uh, a, a small group of people there are priests and Levites and temple singers uh, and those who are going to support uh, and encourage the development of the worship life of God's people um, and <clears throat> Quite soon, what we see is, uh, is Ezra um, recognizing that the country or the people are in crisis. And the crisis is to do about their relationships. So let's look at Ezra chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. And I will put up little bits and pieces as we're going along. So here we are in chapter 9, verse 1. After these things have been done, the leaders came to me, to Ezra, and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Prezi I'm getting dry mouthed here, 
Can you pass some water up, lovely? Um, Perisites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they have taken some of their daughters. Excuse me. They've taken some of their daughters and, as wives for themselves and their sons, so they've mingled the holy race with the peoples around them, and the leaders and officials have led the way in this. On to the next slide, it should highlight. There we go. Here's a key verse here, a key part of that, mingled the holy race. What was um, disturbing? What was the crisis that Ezra was being faced with? This was something to do with the people mingling themselves with uh, the other tribes, the other people, the other uh, cultures around them. Why is that so significant? Let's go on to the next slide. Um, take us back to Abraham and to God speaking to Abraham in Genesis 28, 14. He said, your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So we're reminded here that God has a, a mega purpose. And his purpose is to reach out to all peoples everywhere and to bring them back to himself. Bring them into a, a new uh, relationship, a renewed relationship with himself. If we go on to the next slide, please. He wants to create a holy nation. Here is Moses, and speaking to Moses in Exodus 19, verses 5 to 6. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So here was um, a people who didn't deserve this. Here were people who were no more special than anybody else, but God chose them to be the means by which he would reach out to all peoples. I want to create, uh, I want you to be a holy people, a dedicated people to me, a people focused on living my way in obedience to me and showcasing to the world what it's like to be a people under the care of a loving God. Now on to the next slide. So here's the connection with our reading today. So as part of that being my people, part of that being a set-apart set people, uh, a holy people, do not intermarry with the people around you. Do not give your daughters and their sons or take their daughters to your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So God desiring to create a dedicated holy people is saying, here's a warning here, is if you, if you, uh, if you refocus your eyes outward uh, onto the nations and the peoples around you, if you, uh, if you will find yourself being drawn away from me. You will find yourself uh, in a constant conflict between what I say and what they say. And if you intermarry with them, which is uh, um, one of the, the most powerful ways of, uh, 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 of changing people's attitudes and views of life, then you will find that the influences of those other people will come into your lives, will come into your families. Uh, and that's going to be uh, a really difficult thing to, to, to resist. So let's move on. Back to Ezra 9, verse 1. So the leaders have come then uh, to Ezra, and they're, and they're saying the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices. So one of the things... Um, that uh, you could get drawn into by uh, uh, intermarrying, so we're all becoming more and more merged as a family together, is drawn into their religious practices. And if you know anything a little uh, about the, the sort of practices uh, of the pagan nations around Jerusalem at that time, their detestable pra practices is a good phrase. It's talking about... Um, uh, the way that that faith encouraged incest 
encouraged uh, um, a whole range of, de uh, of deprivation and uh, deviation sexually because it was part of the worship of their gods. And the worst that I've heard of anyway is that uh, it could include child sacrifice. So you're persuaded by focusing yourself or becoming committed to another god, uh, loyal to that particular way of living, obliged to follow that part of life uh, because of the, the commitments you've made in it socially, uh, in, commercially, and in every other way. Um, you find yourself being drawn down a path of, uh, of uh, influence from another source it's quite a dreadful thing. Uh, I, in Israel, went to one of the places where Baal worship took place, and they say, here, right on these altars, these stones, you see, children were sacrificed to God, to that God. Awful, detestable practice. That's what's going to happen if you follow the influence of those who are not godly. So how was, if we can go on, please, how is Ezra responding to this? And the next slide. Well, he could, uh, and it says this uh, uh, in chapter 7, he could have ordered the imprisonment of those leaders who were uh, uh, arranging the, you know, the intermarrying of their children. He could have had them imprisoned. He could have had their properties confiscated. He could, in fact, have had them executed. But he didn't. He, he, he could have preached a sermon. <laughs> he could have lectured. You know, he could have uh, done his best to make the few people feel guilty and, uh, and miserable and, 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 uh, and, uh, and just a terrible people. He, he could have uh, called for repentance and confession. But he didn't, did he? What he did was this. What he did was fall on his knees. What he did was to tear uh, out his hair or parts of his hair. What he did was to demonstrate uh, how deeply grieved he was by, by ripping his clothes. He, he fell on his knees. And the word here is appalled. He was appalled. And, and what I discovered here, again, uh, with a, a de definition of appalled is that it's about a pale face. You know, if you go into the Latin, apparently. Um, so imagine the color draining from your face. Imagine being stunned by this news, being shocked, horrified, dismayed in the greatest extent by the, what you've just heard. You know, here is a people who, if they continue down this road, are abandoning what God has said and closing down the possibility that God, through us, a holy people, are going to reach out to all the world. All of that is now jeopardized by what Ezra is seeing around him. He is appalled. And if we go on to verse 4, um, he went to the temple, he prayed, he sat there, in silence, he was trying to absorb the pain of that uh, and the, 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 the extent of what that could mean. And as he's doing that, we read this. Everyone who trembled in fear of the word of the Lord of Israel gathered around him because of the unfaithfulness of the captives who had returned. And I sat there in shock until the evening service. Ezra is an incredible influencer. He set an example. He identified with the, the, the weakness and the faults of his people. He didn't uh, um, reach out and condemn, but he fell on his knees to pray for them. And there were people around who were observing that, who were watching that, who were seeing that, uh, and uh, people who also um, uh, honored God, uh, whose spirits were open to being um, uh, uh, 
told and, uh, and encouraged uh, uh, yeah, that what Ezra is doing is right, what, is, what we are doing is wrong. And they trembled. It says in fear, but you know that word fear in the Bible is much more about awe and respect and, uh, and not groveling before God. It's, uh, it's honoring him. And this other group of people now join with Ezra. They now want to, to, to be a people who are obedient to God. So Ezra prays. And we'll just read this and let it speak for itself. Oh my God, I'm too ashamed. And I want to ask you, put yourself in this whatever situations you're in right now, how have we compromised with the world? How have we um, listened to the voices around us? How much have we given in to um, those influences that would persuade us that it's okay to do what we're doing? Oh Lord, I'm too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you because of our sins. Our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hands of foreign kings, as it is today. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he's given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, oh our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, the land you're entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or their daughters to your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our, our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, O oh God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and, and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or saviour or survivor? O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, no, not one of us can stand in your presence. And if we go on to the next slide, um, you might uh, be uh, um, affected by this, uh, this powerful verse that's so often used. Uh, this is what uh, Ezra is doing. This is what he calls you and I to do when we walk away from God. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And I think God would say that as powerfully to us today as he said in those years gone by. 
And if we move on to the next slide, please. If we were to just poke our nose into Ezra chapter 10, verse 1, we read this. Now, while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, and children, <clears throat> gathered to him from Israel, from the people, uh, for the people wept bitterly. Ezra, a single man, fell on his knees before God, heartbroken over what he saw. Others, seeing that, gathered around him. And they too were heartbroken. They too recognized the heart uh, of, of, of Ezra and what it was that mattered so deeply to him. And they joined with him. And now here we read of an even bigger group of people who are also recognizing that influenced, influence has been growing. And Ezra is influencing us even today. So what can we draw from all of this? Very quickly, if we can just move on. So there's a few slides to pop, <coughs> just a few um, key mark, <coughs> key strokes, please. Applying the insights, uh, no, back one. <laughs> there should be three, just try it. One, two, three, doesn't matter, I'll say it, okay. <coughs> right, so applying these insights then to ourselves. Um, so the first one would, let's remind ourselves of the battle of the mind that the world around us is seeking to persuade us to follow its way, is seeking to persuade us to abandon our identity as Christians and our following of Jesus. Let's recognize that battle. Let's also um, ask God to help us increasingly to be clear about what we're hearing from him so, so that we know with confidence that you say this and this is the truth and this is what I stand on and this is where I should go. And we need to learn how to hear because there's so many voices, so many powerful voices seeking to draw us in another direction. So the count to that, we need to learn to hear God, hear him well. And then that final little encouragement there says, uh, you know, never underestimate uh, the influence of the people you have allowed into your life at work at play at school wherever those people have an influence on us so are we walking as people who are conscious of these things people who are seeking to be graceful uh, and gentle and kind in this world following jesus yet not falling to and falling into line with uh, the attitudes and values of the people around us powerful thing. Let's just pray and then I think we need to hand back to Steve. Father, you have uh, described yourself as a holy God, separated, set apart, distinct, special, pure, lovely, complete. And you've called us to be your people, to share with you in these things and more. And you've called us to separate ourselves from the nations around us so that we might follow you completely. Lord, would you please forgive us? Father, many, many times, and I would put my hand up to this very much, the many times of compromise, of not speaking up, for the many times of seeking the easier path, for the many times of avoiding conflict and confrontation. For the many times of wanting peace. But it's a false peace. Please forgive us, Lord. Help us to be the people who um, delight in you, who showcase you to the world, who are different, wholly set apart. Help us in this. And Lord, remind us, please, that every single one of us can be a powerful example to the people around us. Remind us, Lord, that the way we live our lives is directly speaking to the people, to our families, our friends, our work colleagues. Help us be people who honor you before all, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.